Association, which is what led you to write this book in particular. Okay. I think it's been in the making for a while. Um, I remember going around galleries and museums and costume e exhibits and overhearing people talking about what they were looking at. And one of the things I heard a lot was people looking at, say, a 1750s dress with the big, wide panniers, and then seeing an early 1800s dress next to it with the high waist, and kind of saying, well, what happened in between? Like, what's, you know, the journey with, from this style to this one, because they're so hugely different. And obviously museums can't have a massively detailed chronological timeline, because, you know, finances of space, of, you know, garments that are accessible. So it's not the museum's fault, but it's something that I think left people, leaves them a bit unsatisfied, maybe. Um, and I had that in mind when I came to actually write the proposal and, you know, pitch the idea that this could be something people could have within the museums, you know, when they're wandering about, and just to fill in those gaps. Um, also, when I was doing my PhD, which was on um, theatre history and historical um, costume in 19th century dramas, it's very specific, um, I, w I did a survey of um, various people asking them to pinpoint certain styles because I was interested, particularly so when you have a production that was made in the 1960s that's set in the 1870s, whether people will pick up both those time frames, whether they'll be able to recognise that it was a production that was meant to be set in the 1870s. And the results were really interesting. Um, I, I got, with the Foresight Saga from 1968, people looking at images from that, I got, oh, that's set in 1965, is it? You know, it's uh, not even seeing the bustle dresses and, you know, the Victorian hairdos. Um, so I just felt there was a market for this, just to create something accessible, something, you know, that would appeal to people that have maybe a bit of knowledge of fashion history, but not a huge amount, you know, so something that was, yeah, a kind of introductory kind of reader, I suppose. It's interesting that you mentioned the museum audience who were looking at the authentic artifact, the authentic mm. dress, and the TV mm. costume audience who might be exposed to something that is perhaps more authentic representation of the time when the show was shot mm. than the actual um, original garments that would have been made when the show was set. Is this then perhaps a tool to help people understand what is authentic and what is genuine when they're watching these TV dramas. Yeah, this is a bugbear of mine because um, I wrote an article for The Conversation recently about um, historical accuracy in, in costume and in TV shows and whether it matters. To me, it matters hugely. I'm, I'm such a pedant when it comes to these things. And, you know, if I watch something that seems a bit wrong, I just, I can't see this anymore. I can't watch any more of it, which is, which is not maybe helpful because I think producers have many different you know, agendas to work to and they want to make it sexy for a modern audience and they want to make it relatable and that might not always mean strict accuracy. Um, but I think you know, we, live in, we live in uncertain times at the moment and the, the passion for vintage and, and sort of nostalgia that's coming in in fashion and in many areas means that TV shows and films set in the past are really, really popular. Um, you know, even things like Game of Thrones, which is set in a fantasy land, has a, a big historical element to a lot of the costumes. Um, and so I felt it was timely as well, you know, that something like this would be, would be something people maybe needed or, or wanted just to explore a bit more. Yeah. Yes. And perhaps now people have higher standards when it comes to authenticity and detail, mm. particularly with high definition telly. There is yes, exactly. Detail that people might see that they haven't seen, yeah. seen before. Um, and... You've got then a history that goes all the way through to the 1970s, so yep. covering hundreds of years of, of dress history. Mm. Um, the title, of course, is How to Read a Dress. Is the way that you read a dress different throughout the various time periods that you look mm. at? That's a good question. I'm not, I'm not sure that it is in many ways. Um, I think that the kind of approach that I give in the book is to start from literally from the head to the floor, you know, look at the neckline, look at the sleeves. A look at the, the position of the waist, which of course goes massively up and down over the centuries. Um, look at the shape of the skirt and all those different things. If, if you look at them very separately and then step back and look at them together, can really give us a very thorough overview of so many aspects of history, not just clothing, you know, but many things that were going on at the time. So you're identifying a list of features that people yeah. should be looking at yes. in order to understand and, and to locate a dress in history. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So hopefully that will be a set of tools that people can use when they go to a museum and say, I recognise this dress is from this period because the direct, the waist ticks this yeah. box and the neckline ticks that exactly. box and, and so on. Just to get within a small date range, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and each of those things changes presumably as, mm. as time 
time progresses. Yeah, and quicker in some, you know, obviously areas than others, but mm. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so clearly you spend a lot of time looking at museum dresses. Yes. Yeah. Which um, museums in particular do you find yourself whiling away hours and hours and <laughs> gazing at dresses? Well, that was, that was a lovely, really lovely part of the process was, was choosing, you know, which dresses I was going to use. Um, and I was very fortunate to be um, a volunteer at a local historical society in, in Perth, where I live, called the Swan Guildford Historical Society, getting it out there, you know, to the world. Um, very small society, but they have an incredible collection of sort of colonial era um, dresses. And I knew the costume keeper, and, and she let me go in there and, and handle the dresses and look at them inside out, which of course is a, such an important tool, you know, for, for reading and for decoding dress. Um, and I, I decided to use a lot from there, well a fair number from there, just because they are so representative of not just what people were wearing in Australia, but what people were wearing in Europe and the States, because fashions um, actually move very quickly into Australia from, from Europe and the States, despite what people often think. Um, so I used those, um, my husband photographed them, uh, which was great, um, and yeah, and I found that, that really great because I could actually see them. I used a couple from the V&A, just because they're their collection is so wonderful and you know world renowned. Um, but I didn't want to use things only from places like the V&A because they're dresses that are so accessible, many of them. And I wanted to have dresses that had never been shown before, um, and also ones that were representative not just of the elite but of you know other classes of society. I'm not working class. It's very hard to get hold of original, complete working class outfits. But um, yeah, I wanted to have a big range and. Part of that was also geographical, so I've got a couple of Australian institutions, um, a couple of British ones, quite a few from the States, because I also worked with um, the University of Shippensburg in Pennsylvania, and they've got a beautiful fashion archive, which is very representative from about 1830s until, well, kind of until about 2010, I think they've got pieces, and got a really good relationship with the curator there. Um, so those kind of personal relationships were wonderful and, you know, curators helping me to choose as well what, what would be especially useful and, and what yeah. would work, yeah. And you said there that um, you, um, you hoped that there'd be more working class dresses mm. available, but actually some of those were quite hard to, to come by. Mm. Um, did you find that you really wanted to include a particular garment and you, you couldn't track it down? Yeah, I think, well, that is true for the working class ones. I really did want to have a couple of examples in. Um, and I think the difficulty is that either they exist in pieces, you know, so you have like a bodice and, you know, somewhere and no skirt or a skirt somewhere else or, you know, literal pieces of fabric that remain. Or people would remake their clothes so often that the clothes would just have, you know, been worn and worn and worn and just didn't survive anymore. So that was, that was disappointing. Um, there were some dresses that I wanted to show, but price was prohibitive or the museum you know the prices they were charging to, to use the, the dresses which was unfortunate but you know understandable um, but really I think I was pretty lucky I think most of the ones I really really wanted I managed to get to get hold of yeah and you got a chance to look at them really closely and inspect them which yeah presumably revealed other things that you might not have seen mending for example which yes. tells you an awful lot about the culture and and the way that these dresses were actually used yeah um there's one example in particular there's a brilliant little story attached to this there's um a lovely uh, striped silk um taffeta dress from the australian collection i mentioned before um it was worn as a wedding dress and we think it was made by the bride because there are a couple of really telltale signs there's a, a skirt that is, isn't sewn flush to the lining so it's kind of overhanging slightly at the bottom uh, which again on a mannequin in an exhibition you wouldn't necessarily notice but when you're looking at it up close and feeling it and you know and inspecting you, it's really obvious and also um, there's a peplum at the back of the dress um, with a, a sort of layered frill at the back and it's sewn really roughly onto the outside so we know that this wouldn't have been made by a professional dressmaker but by someone who was just very you know very skilled at home dressmaking this dress tells us a lot more because this poor bride made the dress for her wedding drove herself to church. She lived in a very rural town in Western Australia. Uh, I think she lived with her mother and sister. Uh, when she got to the church, there was nobody there. No groom, no priest, no guests. Empty. She was like, okay, I'm sure this is the right date. So she drove herself in her horse and trap home. Um, went back the next week and everyone was there. <laughs> and, which is a, a lovely story. And this is what I love because it gives you these personal you know, insights into the dresses that you often get with these small collections where they have all these, you know, often orally, sto oral storytelling that's been written down. Um, 
And what had happened was the Harvey River, where she lived in the Shire of Harvey, had flooded, and it completely prevented everyone who lived on the other side of the river from getting there. So, you know, when you look at this dress and you know that story, you just picture her in this dusty cart in Western Australia in the heat, you know, yeah. trying to get to her own wedding, and then the terrible disappointment <laughs> of getting there to find and her those, groom not those there. Those stories, not, not just complete stories, but also seeing mm. the dress in context is so important, and you don't necessarily yeah. see this in a lot of museums like the V&A or, or the, the Fashion Museum in, in Bath, mm. um, you just see a dress, but not how it might be worn. And what you've got in here is, is photos alongside some of the dresses. Yes. Does that um, help to reveal a little bit more about the dress in the context in a particular historical period? You mean when it's a picture of the dress being worn? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that, that is kind of gold. You know, when you find a dress and there's also a picture of somebody wearing it, it it's rare, actually. I didn't come across that many times. Um, but one example that springs to mind is a, a 1950s dress, um, and I had to Photoshop it a bit to make the skirt, you know, all kind of free feet as it would have been worn in, in sort of the fashion magazines and things. But I've got a picture also of the owner wearing it, um, and it looks so different. It's, it's very, I mean, it's still a lovely dress, but, it, you know, she's not wearing um, a kind of special bra, you know, she's not wearing all the big petticoats. So... I think that shows us how ordinary people who maybe couldn't afford all these extra accoutrements, you know, and, and who maybe wouldn't have wanted to, depending on the climate of where they were living and things, how they would have worn these things on a regular basis. So where possible, I think that's absolutely just, you know, as I say, gold. Wonderful to have those images. And I wish they existed more often. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it gives us a little bit of an insight, not into how the dress was worn, but also... Um, how the, the staging at the museum is so artificial and is different to how yeah. you might encounter the dress in real life. Yeah, exactly. Um, and of course, you know, museums pre chiefly working with conservation and it has to be a certain light and a certain temperature and of course, you know, those are all vital. Um, but yeah, the, the, the images are, are lovely. And museums do a wonderful job, but it's yeah. impossible for them to portray everything as it would exactly have been worn, you know. Mm. So you've got photographs of dresses as they are in the museums, you've got photographs of people in dresses, mm -hmm. but some of the dresses here don't exist anymore, so yeah. you've had to work from paintings. Mm. What were the challenges you faced when you are doing that? Mm. Big challenges, um, because I think when you're sort of reading dress from a painting, you're almost doing it in reverse, because you're having to look at it and say, right, okay, this is um, a representation of a garment, of a sitter, most of the time, of course, especially with the examples I've used, which are six, uh, 16th and 17th centuries, it's going to be elite sitters who can afford to have their portrait painted. So you've got to think um, the dress might have been embellished. Um, it might have been a particular dress that they wanted to wear that maybe wasn't representative of fashion at the time. Uh, you've got to think about what the artist wanted to portray, which might often have been very different from what the sitter wanted. Um, but having said that, you know, paintings are an incredibly valuable primary resource and they shouldn't be discounted. And of, of course, you know, for some instances, you have to use them because there's nothing else. Yes. Um, and the ones I chose, I think I, I was fairly happy um, that they were representative, at least of a certain style and of certain types of trimming, you know, and of a certain shape that existed at the time. But yeah, challenging. Um, yes. Something that I don't think you should use in place of garments. But if you have if to, you have to yes. very useful, yeah. yeah. And um, presumably you, not, you looked not only at the photos, sorry, at the, the paintings, mm. but also other sources as well, text descriptions, for example, that told you a little bit more. Yeah, um, yeah, they were useful. Um, I used well, Samuel Pepys' diary and some of the really famous ones, but I, I really loved looking at, at letters, not necessarily from well-known people, but just people that lived you know, and wrote letters to each other. In the 19th century, there was a lot, you know, big um, letter-writing um, culture and... People wrote in huge detail about what they were wearing and what they wanted to buy and, you know, what other people around them were wearing and what their sister was wearing that they were jealous of and wish they had themselves. And so we get these beautiful, you know, florid descriptions often um, of, of clothes. And, and also I found magazines and newspapers just wonderful because there's massive long fashion columns, again, particularly in the 19th century, describing what was accessible um, or how you could make it at home as well. So that was another nice touch. Um, people talking as well about people going to the theatre and what they were wearing because that was a key place, you know, of course, to spot celebrities, but as, as they were, you know, not known as celebrities then, but people that were, you know, in the public eye. Um, and what people who were fashionable and, and elite and could afford to go to the theatre, what they were wearing on a night out. So that was a, a really, a really important yes. source as well. Yeah, it some insight into the dress culture. Yes, exactly, well the, the in a much broader sense. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And presumably that. that culture of wearing the dress rather than just mm. the dress itself is 
key for you when you're writing a book. Yeah, absolutely. And what it what it might you know be like to wear those dresses on an everyday yeah. basis, which for us I think is hard to yeah. to imagine. Yeah. And what that culture involves, of course, changes mm. throughout the book. What a dress means changes throughout the book. Mm. Um, and I noticed that you've got dresses and skirts. Yes. But you've drawn the line there. You haven't mentioned, well, well at least you haven't looked at trousers, but you have you have acknowledged the fact that women started wearing trousers. How important was it to um, to not look at trousers, but also to acknowledge the fact that the the meaning of the dress changes mm. as soon as women's trousers are introduced? Yeah, I think I think I couldn't really not mention trousers because they were so pivotal in the way that fashion became more fluid and you know more unisex and. The reason I finished at 1970 was not at all because dresses weren't a primary part of the wardrobe, but because trousers were becoming more acceptable. Um, yeah, I think talking about the evolution of anything, you need to acknowledge everything else that was going on at the same time. And I didn't want to focus on them because it is how to read a dress, um, not how to read trousers or you know trouser suits. But yeah, I, I think that broader kind of cultural knowledge and, and, and history around clothing as a whole yeah. has to be in there somewhere otherwise it would just be too too narrow and too static yeah yeah absolutely and the, the meaning of a dress and, and what it represents mm. changes significantly as, as yeah. you go through those different exactly and that's why I've got a couple of suits in there as well you know mm. because they're not dresses but they're a kind of a natural progression of you know the dresses being the only thing a woman would wear to being the other options that came in into yeah. her wardrobe yeah so you mentioned there why you chose to finish in the 1970s. Yeah. Why did you choose to start? <laughs> when um, you did. 1550, I chose... Well, it's quite a nice, neat date, you know. Um, but I chose it really because of the lack of gar ex existing garments before that date. Um, and I, I know I've used a couple of paintings, but I really didn't want to have a whole chapter where there were no existing garments at all. I, I really wanted to keep that, that element there. Um, so... I looked around, I thought about starting at 1500, um, and I really couldn't find anything apart from fragments. And then I found this beautiful um, Italian dress from Pisa uh, that's um, the, one of the oldest surviving complete garments, and it's just a lovely example of, of Italian fashions at that time. And I just thought that was a, a really nice, bright, interesting one to start with, and it, I just, it just pops out the page, it's a lovely deep red, you know, so, so I started there. And yeah, I think I think it kind of I think it starts at a nice round mm. round date. Yeah. yeah, and a lot of these styles dressed from various different periods are perhaps more familiar to audiences mm. than others um, through things like TV adaptations and and so on. And yeah. you said that you, you, you want your um, audience to be in part people who are fans of those mm. um, TV adaptations. Um, did that lead your choice of, of dates, or, or did it lead you to focus on any particular styles of dresses, knowing who the, your audience might be? Um, I think I, I hope I wouldn't wasn't too led by that because, of course, you know, TV show fashions change and develop, and you know, different things become popular at different times. Although Austin has been consistent, you know, I suppose um, in the last sort of few decades. So Regency uh, era. Regency era. era. Um, I wanted to have a lot of Regency, but I think also. I did have Downton Abbey in mind and the great popularity that's had. But no, I, I, although I had TV shows and films in mind because I knew that people who were interested in those would be interested in the book, um, I don't think I was led too strongly. I just didn't want to kind of set it up and people to go, oh, well, obviously she's targeting Downton because it's nearly all 20th century or, you know, she obviously loves Jane Austen and nothing else because it's all Empire Line gowns. No, I, it was in my mind, but it wasn't a kind of huge, yeah, um, pushing factor on me, no. Mm. Have you realised anything about the authenticity, or, or anything other than that even, um, in these adaptations, having spent all this time studying the dresses at museums? Mm. Or do you mean in terms of the authenticity in the production? Or? Yes, or, or any other observations that you might have? Um, I think I've noticed either that production seem to take you know, original garments and, and paintings and reproduce them very faithfully, or they tend to kind of take a lot of liberties. <laughs> um, and often within one production, you get a bit of both. I mean, everyone's probably familiar with the Tudors, which came out, oh, I don't know, it's sort of early 2000, 2005 or six, something like that. And there's been a lot of criticism about those costumes because they don't really relate to anything at the time. They haven't 
unlike the, um, a production in the 1970s, which is the Glenda Jackson, Elizabeth I, and um, Henry VIII and his, his six wives, which only copied a, a seemingly Holbein paintings. The Tudors took a lot of liberties and, and made some very odd garments. And I think it was partly, from what the producers have said, it was partly because they wanted to make it different. They wanted to make it look different than anything they'd seen before. And they didn't think authenticity mattered. They wanted to bring Henry VIII to life, to life in a different way. But also, as they've recently said, it was to do with budget. And they didn't, you know, that they wanted to just, I don't know, to have a kind of fantasy world rather than something that was very, very accurate because they felt that's what people would react to more. Yes, something mm. sure, something nice to look at. Yes, exactly. Than, yeah. yeah. And of course, there are concerns not just for authenticity but also for communicating certain moods and, and mm. certain well, characteristics. Exactly. So there's, there's other kinds of expression that needs to go on there as well as authenticity. So there's... Yeah. Somebody's got to decide which is more important, the authenticity or the expression and is it yeah. difficult balance to strike? Oh, it's such a hard job and, you know, I kind of find myself, I feel a bit harsh really because it must be very difficult trying to get that balance right and with all the other things that producers and designers have to contend with, you know, yes. budget and, you know, availability of fabrics mm. and things and, you know, so yeah, it's, it's very hard um, yeah. but I am done. And you say availability of, of fabrics mm. and there's potentially a, a difference between authenticity of look and authenticity of, of feel and it may mm. be that actually these things look authentic but are worn in a very different way that they are made from different fabrics perhaps. Yeah of course and that's obviously of course down to very practical reasons mm. as well yeah so I, I understand that yeah. yeah. So you've explained why you um, chose a particular end point and start point a particular time period but you also chose to, to, uh, to um, look at dresses from the UK and um, Europe mm. and not the rest of the world um, but of course these dresses are influenced by the rest of the world yes yeah I've had a lot of people asking me about that um, I think I'd love to have done something that you know was even even broader and even more global but I think the problem is I, I had to kind of stop somewhere mm. um, and my own research has been into western dress so I thought and I'm going to keep with, with what I know as well and, you know, and what I've, I've kind of studied up till now um, yeah, it, it's such a huge ballpark. Uh, but as you say, I mean, they are influenced by the rest of the world. And I've got um, examples of a 60s uh, dress and coat that was very much influenced by Indian fashions, um, particularly after the, the Beatles' trip to India in 1960, I think it was seven or eight, when, you know, those styles became hugely influential into the hippie movement and then leading into psychedelia. And so, yeah, I've, I've used, I have mentioned of course, where it's necessary and, and gone into it in detail. But again, I couldn't go into it in too much detail because then it would become not a, a guide, but it would become a much bigger kind of thesis and, and sort of monograph, which I didn't want it to be. Yeah. Although that must be very tempting as an author to, to put in all this other information that's really interesting but not quite where your yes, I did. Have, are. Well, you'll know. I, mean, I don't know what's happened to you, but I, I did have one um, draft of a chapter where I sent it in and they were like, yeah, you're really going off on a on a tangent here it, this could be a whole other book leave it leave it so they had to rein me in which which was good because someone had to yeah. you know. was there anything that was really interesting that you quite liked to have shared that you didn't get to push in there because it was beyond your remit oh, I think oh, that's such a good question um, I'd like to have probably put in a bit more about the influence of the theatre because I was thinking so much about contemporary film and, 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 and theatre and TV um, and because I did so much when I was a student about the history of the theatre I'd love to have put that in but again there are so many agendas there were so many different political economic social cultural reasons um, behind why theatre costumes were as they were I did just make use of you know of people talking about what people wore to the theatre and I kind of left mm -hmm. it at that and that's that's a whole other a whole other yeah. publication I think but yeah ideally I'd like to have got in more I guess more a broader cultural outlook I suppose of what was mm -hmm. going on at the time yeah and you, you come from this costume background, so obviously that, that is something that mm. interests you. Um, what are the main differences between studying costume and studying fashion? I think, for me, the main difference is that costume is fictional. It's made for a character. Um, and then again, at the same time, I like to have my, <laughs> my costume and adaptations being, you know, accurate. Um, but I think... It kind of comes down to when you're looking at dresses and when you're looking at older productions, like I mentioned before, and trying to work out you know, how, how much they relate to the time period or to the time period they were made, you've got all these levels. And this is something I think that did come in really closely. Say, for example, you're looking at a bustle dress. 
you've got to recognise it's a bustle dress. Then you have to take it another level and say, is it 1870s or 1880s bustle? Then you have to look at the historical precedents, um, the sort of mantua from the 1690s with its looped up skirt, which influenced the bustle dress, and then the 18th century polonaise, which influenced the bustle dress. And then you have to go into looking at um, costumes and uh, costumes from films, from the stage, from TV that have done that. And again, looking at the influences that would have shaped them, the cultural aesthetics, you know, the, um, the sexual aesthetics of the time, you know, all these things that are so important. So it, it becomes hugely complex, I think, mm -hmm. and hugely layered, but for me that's part of the fun. Yeah. It, it sounds like a costume designer would have to know more about fashion history than a fashion designer. I think they would. Um, I've been very surprised when I've chatted to people that have run you know, costume making courses mm -hmm. and things at universities and asked them how much fashion history they do. And this is in Australia, so I don't know about, about here. But, and the answer is, is not much. Um, I think they really encourage the students to have a hugely imaginative approach, which is wonderful. But I think it's really important to have that grounding because also having that knowledge can influence you know, the, the kind of intricacies and subtleties of the garment in so many ways. You know, having those mix of influences can create yeah. something really incredible. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. It's and they also have to know about the filmmaking process or, or stagecraft or whatever other these yes, kind of things. Yes, exactly. And well. there's so many limitations, mm -hmm. particularly on stage, you know, things that you can and can't move in and quick costume changes and all this stuff. So, yes. yeah, it's very... Yes. Dressing and undressing. Yeah, exactly. Getting in and out of the costume. Using Velcro, yeah. you know, all these things. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I imagine things like sound as well, that the sound that a garment makes can be authentic or inauthentic and, and that may be my, a concern for Yeah, the oh totally, because dresses were, were noisy, you know, like, mm -hmm. and apparently in the early 20th century it was considered very sexy to have a kind of rustling petticoat under your dress, so this was something that, you know, when you went to buy a dress, it, you know, from a department store when those came in, this was something that people took notice of, but on stage, I mean, yeah, or on, on you know, on film when you've got these very sensitive microphones picking everything up it'd be impossible <laughs> so you'd have to get rid of that particular strand of accuracy yes. yeah although the sound is often layered on afterwards mm. with Foley so you might yeah. have somebody else wearing a dress that sounds authentic to make the sound which is different from the yeah. dress that's actually on the screen <laughs> yeah you get many authentic that sounds wrong yeah mm. exactly yeah you you briefly mentioned there the um the transition from um, or t towards department stores and mass mm. manufacture and things. Um, is that something that came up in your, your search? Did you notice a particular difference between um, dresses pre-industrial revolution and mm. after when mass manufacture happened and, and things were being made on a large scale? Yeah, um, definitely. I think there's one example in the book, um, which some of you might have seen, which is a kind of russet red um, 1890s dress, so a bodice and a skirt um, with the kind of leg of mutton sleeves, and it's got a sort of beautiful gold um, uh, design on it. I think the difference there is that that's the kind of thing that everyone, not everyone, but you know, people with you know, a sort of income, professional people, could afford, because it, with the advent of all the machines to make dresses and put them together, there was a lot more time and money available to sort of lavishly hand embroider and hand detail them. So less time was spent in actually putting them together and more time was spent on, on ornamenting them and making them look beautiful. So people who before would have worn very plain things were now able to wear things that looked much more luxurious, even though often the trimming and you know the silks that were used were you know much le lesser quality than, than would have been worn by the elite. Also I think um, that particular dress is interesting because it came with a pair of so-called exchange sleeves which could be worn for evening wear. So you often got this, that people would buy a skirt that they particularly liked and a bodice that was for day wear and then they'd buy a separate bodice for evening or just a pair of sleeves that would then be added on separately to make it a completely different garment. Mm -hmm. And with the advent of department stores and not having to pay a dressmaker huge amounts of money or not having to make your own clothes, there was now this freedom to kind of mix and match which of course led on to people wearing, you know, partly the fashion for wearing blouses and skirts rather than just a one-piece dress. Mm -hmm. It became more popular because it was just easier to get hold of these things. Yeah. Mm. Um, and of course Chanel introducing the, the interchangeable yeah. wardrobes rather than just one single Yeah, exactly. Dress. Exactly. It really changed yeah. the way women perceive yeah. themselves and the world around them, yeah. yeah. Mm. And um, you suggested there that the introduction of, of machinery and mass manufacture led to this um, fashion for hand embroidery, mm. um, not just because there was time to spend on it, but in order to distance those 
more desirable garments from the, the garments that were now affordable to mm. the lower classes. Yeah. So, as fashion always has been, um, it's worn in order to um, establish the wearer, yes. as, as their social status, to establish themselves as an elite. Mm. And of course, when everybody can afford a dress, yeah. and everybody can afford an expensive gown, then you need to find other ways to spend money on it. Mm. Um, and embroidery is a way to do that. Something that's handmade is visibly more expensive exactly. than something that's manufactured by button exactly. shoes. Exactly. And I think the elite would then show that they were elite by, mainly by, you know, the, the quality of the fabric that was used. Yeah. You know, you, you could tell a, a rich silk from one that was, you know, of much lower quality. So, you know, and wearing furs and things like that. So that would distinguish. Yeah. 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 Printed patterns versus mm. embroidery. Exactly, yeah. And so on. Yeah. Yes. And it's, it's interesting to track how patterns change when um, patterns become accessible suddenly to the working classes, to the yes. servants of the household and so on. And then the introduction of uniforms mm. because servants were suddenly able to wear things that made them look like the mistress of the Yeah, house. exactly. Um, um, actually, uniforms is, is something that you um, haven't looked at, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, in no, not, no not, not, in, not in detail, no. Um, I do mention uh, WAF uniforms from World War II, yes. the Women's Auxiliary Air Force, mm -hmm. um, because it did influence the way women's suits developed in, in World War II and, and afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, and, and conversely, women's suits that were developing influenced WAF uniforms to make them maybe not high fashion, but to give them that kind of elegance. And you know, they did sometimes have knit in waist and, and things that would make the women that were forced to, to wear them, um, you know, in wartime, make, you know, more desirable, make them feel that they were wearing something they could be proud of wearing that would look professional but also would look, you know, attractive and, um, yeah, and, and that's a quite an interesting, an interesting area, I think. I'd like to, to look more at that, yeah, the influence of, of military on, on civilian clothes and then vice versa. Yes. Yeah, but I, I do have, I mean, military wear, you know, throughout the centuries has been, in women's dress particularly, has been, has been very important in, you know, braiding and epaulettes and, and those kind of beautiful froggings and those sorts of details became really, really fashionable when countries were at war or, you know, conflict. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so you saw then not only international influence but influence from the military, from mm. other walks of life, from um, stuff that was traditionally um, from men's fashion yeah. or men, men's wear yeah, yeah. than from, from women's wear. Yeah. Um, did you see the influence of, of men's fashion seep into some of the dresses that you looked at? Yeah, hugely. There's one particular example um, from the late 18th century, a, a reading goat, um, also known as a great coat dress. And this kind of tied into enlightenment ideals of making dress much more practical and, and able to be worn outside. And not sportswear necessarily. I think there were still separate riding habits. But these were clothes that people who were particularly people who were wealthy and who had leisure time to spend, would wear to show that they had leisure time to spend. So, you know, I'm wearing this much more simple and practical dress because I have the time and the money to, to do nothing and wonder about my estate. Um, and, of course, it fed into, into more fashion more broadly. But, the, yeah, this particular example um, was very strongly um, modelled on a man's great coat with the kind of caped collar um, and the button placement at the back that you'd see in men's suits. Um, and, and this became something that was seen much more regularly, um, into the, particularly into the 19th century. Uh, there are little examples of the short Spencer jackets um, with, worn with empire line dresses that had these really broad lapels and the double-breasted um, fastening as well, which of course was very exclusively male up to that point. And, and into the 19th century and 20th, we just see more and more um, when women started to wear suit jackets as well, tailored jackets. Um, the influence is, is very, very close. Not too close, but... Enough that you could look at it and go, oh, yeah, that, that looks like, you know, it's derived from a men's coat or, yeah. So the, very, the visible fastenings, particularly buttons, mm. come from the men's wear, perhaps yeah. military wear. Yeah, particularly mm. from military wear. But it became, I mean, I think men were quite unhappy uh, about the extent to which women were wearing these tailored clothes and things. It, when, um, the sort of, in the late 19th century, when it, we led into women's suffrage and things, I think there are some things I read about in